Thank you so much, Chelly. We're so excited to partner with children of incarcerated caregivers, and I can't wait to tell you more of how you can participate and how you can give uh, to this organization so that we can help them uh, after today's message. But today, right now, we're starting a brand new series. We're starting a series called The Power of Presence. It is our new Christmas series. So Merry Christmas to each and every one of you out there. I know it's not Christmas yet, but we're on our way there. It won't be long before we have to, we are celebrating with our family and friends. You see, uh, this message series is all about presence. And I'm not talking about the presence wrapped in a box. I'm talking about your presence, the presence of God, right? Your physical presence is a gift to your family and to your church family. And it makes an incredible difference in the love and fellowship that you share right? The a presence of God in our lives is a gift to us, right? Not just during the holiday season, but every day throughout our lives. And then for us to make the effort to choose to be in the presence of Jesus can actually be empowering and transformative for the direction of our lives. So today, we want to kick off this new series with a message entitled, in his presence, in his presence. Let's pray. Uh, Holy Spirit, would you come? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, would you meet us right where we are as we enter into your presence with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise? We honor you and praise you this morning, and we want to remember that you are the true reason for the season uh, we invite your presence and we humbly come to be in your presence. Let us meet each other in Jesus name. Amen. Today, I'm going to read a passage of scripture that comes from the book of Matthew chapter number two. I'll read verses one through 12 in the NIV version. It reads, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Eleven years ago, Lakita and I drove from central New York to Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland, to surprise my father on his birthday. When we pulled up, unannounced, to this house that I grew up in, there he was, standing in the front yard with a green water hose in his hand, watering the summer parched front lawn. A look of confusion came upon his face and then shock, right? As I was watching him, as we pulled up and we parked the car and then we hopped out and ran over and gave him the biggest hug ever. He was so happy that day. I remember him saying, 
I wasn't expecting you to drive all this way, all the way down here, just for me. Your presence is the best gift that I could have received. But Lakita and I, we had additional plans to exceed both of our parents' uh, expectations. Actually, in the house that evening, as we sang happy birthday to my dad over cake and his favorite vanilla ice cream, uh, we gave him gifts, we gave him cards, and as my dad opened the birthday card from us without his readers on, he announced the signatures. Love, Gary. Lakita and Bobby, who's Bobby? <laughs> you see, without his glasses, he couldn't quite make out that the word said baby. We were expecting, and yes, the gift, this was a great gift uh, to my parents, right? The gift of per our personal presence, and then the gift of the potential of a future child, their first grandchild in the family. This was huge. I have never seen such joy and such unity among my family uh, uh, in my whole existence than in that moment. But the child that we want to speak about today uh, was not born in 2012. No, this child was born between 5 and 1 BCE during the reign of this ruthless uh, yet insecure king named Herod the Great. You can look up Herod the Great and look up more information about him and, and study him. Uh, maybe we'll do a sermon series on Herod one day because he's ruthless. But this child was born in poverty, in a stable to an unknown, unwed teenage mother. His name is Jesus. The one sent by God, the Father, to rescue all of humanity from sin, the sin that separates us from God. And he's, he, he came to help us by, in, 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 through unconventional means, right? Who would have thought to die in order to live? Who would have thought to, to uh, be sacrificed in order that we all could enjoy love, the love of God? Jesus is the one who through his birth, he inaugurated the kingdom right here on earth so that humanity could experience his power, uh, the power of his presence right here, right now, today. There were some people along with his mother, Mary, and his stepfather, Joseph, who chose to be with this new child, born king of the Jews so that they could experience the power that comes along with being in his presence. And they were called the Magi, the Magi. And that is who this group of uh, Magi is who we want to focus the rest of the sermon on today. All right. The Magi is that that word is translated in English as wise men. This is the word we also get our word magician from. These people were astronomers and astrologers, uh, but they weren't the kind that read your palm and, 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 and predict your future through zodiac signs. That, no, 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 they weren't worshiping crystals and burning sage and worshiping the universe. No, these people studied the scriptures. And what did they, they, they do? They in, uh, attempted to apply accurate theology to the miraculous messages that they were observing in the night sky. We know that they made their way to see the Messiah in person. You see, when the Magi observed the star in the sky that they had read about in the scriptures, right, which was predicted by Moses 1,400 years prior to this moment, uh, right, as Moses actually wrote about Jesus in the book of Numbers, chapter number 24, verse number 17. Uh, let me read it to you. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. This was a prediction of the Messiah to come. You see, some people have speculated about this star that the Magi saw in the sky. Some people think that it was Halley's Comet. But watch this. You can't follow a comet because the comet is always on the move. Uh, some people have talked about and speculated that the star was the planet Jupiter, 
right? And that shines so bright. And sometimes it gets so close to earth that it looks like the brightest thing in the sky. Well, you know, Jupiter is visible every 13 months. So its visibility wouldn't have been spectacular to people whose profession it was to study the night sky. Some even predict that this was a supernova, right? That's plausible, but we don't have any historical evidence of any stars exploding at this part of the time in history. So we know that this star was unique. We know that this star was distinct, unlike anything that these astronomers had ever experienced before in their lives. Current day astronomer Michael Molnar, he suggests in his book, The Star of Bethlehem, that the star may have been a conjunction between planets and stars. You see, a conjunction occurs when two or more celestial bodies appear to meet in the night sky from our visibility from Earth. And these events can continue every night in a similar location for weeks. If the wise men were to follow a moment of conjunction, it is possible that they would have been led to a specific direction, in a specific direction, to a specific location. You see, there was, historically, we know this, there was an alignment of Jupiter, Saturn, our moon, and the sun in the constellation of Aries on September 17th, 6 BC. There was another one, though, another conjunction on June 17th, 2 BC. You see, we don't know, the scripture doesn't give us exact dates or times or years of when all of this stuff went down. Uh, we don't even know, uh, uh, the scripture does not offer us a location of the origin of these wise men. It just tells us that they came from the east. We, so we don't know the length of their trip. We don't know how long it took them to get there. Uh, we, uh, when we read about their arrival to Jesus, right, in verse 11, uh, it states that they showed up at a house, not a stable. So all of your uh, uh, nativity scenes that have wise men in it are wrong. I'm sorry to break your hearts. Right? That's unbiblical. They didn't show up to a stable and see a, a baby in a manger. The scripture specifically says right here, read it for yourself, that they showed up to a house, which was probably Joseph's family's house because Bethlehem is where Joseph was from, right? And the Greek word here, they call this the child. Mary was with her child. The Greek word for child here means toddler. So therefore, Jesus is no longer a newborn. He's actually running around the house, probably causing havoc. Can you imagine God in baby form running around a house? <laughs> I, I could, somebody should make a movie about that uh, with CGI and stuff that we have today. That would be amazing. Uh, but all of this just means that it took the Magi some time to get to Jesus. Right? It wasn't an overnight trip. As the Magi spent time in the presence of Jesus, they were impacted by a supernatural experience that changed them forever. So I'd like for the remainder of this sermon to share with you three things that I observe in this text that we can learn from these wise men that uh, we can then apply to our own lives if we truly want to experience the supernatural power of Christ's presence in our own lives this Christmas. Here, here they are. Number one, the wise men saw the star. They read, see, how does that uh, apply? Here we go. They read the scriptures for themselves. So they knew what to expect. It, it, this wasn't just some, oh, the sun, this, the, the star is shining, that's beautiful, let me go to bed and go on with my life. No, they researched the text for themselves, they knew the scriptures. So when something miraculous happened, they were aware of what God was speaking, what he was saying. You see, they had to be observant of, of their surroundings in order to participate in what God was doing. I want you to ask yourself, what is going on around me right now. There is something supernatural happening around each one of us right now. There's supernatural stuff happening all the time. The question is, do you see it? Are you 
aware of it? Are you looking for it? You see, we live in a modern world where our spiritual senses have been intentionally dulled. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11 tells us uh, that uh, we have become dull of hearing. See, we're constantly informed by our personal electronic devices, right? We have mobile devices. Matter of fact, I have a, a mobile phone and, and then this Apple Watch and the things and the, the iPads and the laptops and, and social media and YouTube and all this stuff is always alerting, always stealing my attention from God. How can we hear the voice of God or get our attention back on God so that we are not dull, but we're sharp to hear and notice and see what he's up to. Maybe you, it's different for all of us, but maybe you need to spend more time in prayer. Maybe you need to spend more time uh, uh, increasing your, your, your Bible reading, or maybe you need to spend uh, uh, more time participating in activities and getting to know your neighbors or the strangers in your neighborhood or around you. Uh, We need to take time to observe what God is up to, and then how can we follow his lead? What's going on in your family? What's going on in your neighborhood? What's going on in our city that God is up to and wants us to engage in? Are, Are we seeing those who Jesus actually came for? Are we seeing the least of these? Are we seeing those people that Jesus told us that he was here for in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 18? Are we seeing the poor? Are we seeing the incarcerated? Are we seeing the oppressed, the marginalized, the sick? Are we paying attention to the widows, the orphans, the hungry, the naked, the homeless? When you see the supernatural, when you see maybe something out of the ordinary, When you see something that's not right or something that's irregular, stand alert because that might be your opportune time to see what God is doing and then take the next step that these wise men did. Point number two, they moved out of their comfort zone. Move out of your comfort zone. Are you willing to be inconvenienced in order to be in the presence of the king? See, the Magi were willing to travel hundreds, maybe even thousands of miles. I want to take a moment to commend all of you who come to Mercy Vineyard Church, who make your way to travel, to be a part of this uh, 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 church in person. Praise God for you, all those who travel 30 miles or more. We have such a a miraculous church of people who want to be a part of this community in person, who travel for miles to get here. And then all of you who are watching, who are right here in the Twin Cities, and then all of you who are watching all over the U.S. and all over the world, thank you for, for, for investing your time and your effort and your travel uh, to be a part of what God is doing here. We're so grateful for you. These wise men, they came from the east. We don't know how far, but some predict Babylon or Persia, which would have been over 800 miles away. See, these magi, they believe that Jesus was worth the distance that they had to travel in order to worship him. They thought the experience of being in his presence was so valuable that they would get so much out of it, of worshiping the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, that they made it a priority to be there with him. They also, right, they sacrificed some of their time. We don't know how long it took them to get to that child or how long they stayed with Mary and Joseph or how long their ride back home was. I say ride like they weren't walking or ride on a camel. This is the first century, not even the first century yet. You see, these wise men, these people, they did something with their faith and their theological knowledge. They didn't sit back and ask the preacher, hey, hey, you know, uh, uh, teacher, preacher, teach me more. I want to fill my head. I want to know more, more, more. No, they put into practice what they already knew. They took a risk with what they already had. They left their families behind, folks. 
They left. They might have had kids. They might have had uh, uh, jobs or whatever. They left it behind because they knew that what was ahead of them was so incredibly valuable. See, by faith, they followed a celestial body, believing that God's word would be true, that he would stand by his word, that God would meet them where he was leading. They didn't know what was coming ahead, but they just believed that if I follow God, if I follow his word, if I follow what he's already said, he's going to meet me on that other side. And he's going to do something spectacular in my life. They took a risk. They took a risk because they had faith. One of the sayings here in the vineyard is that faith is spelled R-I-S-K. You don't have faith unless you're willing to take a risk. Are you willing to take a risk to be inconvenienced this Christmas season in order to get closer to Jesus? What area of your life is God calling you to take a risk in this holiday season? Listen to him and let him move in your life. Finally, the third point is this, that these magi, these these wise men, they came to worship him. They worshiped him. What is worship? Worship is showing worth, value. It's, it's positioning oneself properly to, uh, 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 by humbling oneself um, uh, uh, before someone who's great, before greatness. It's being present in the moment. It's giving your best. It's giving of your time, your talents, your, your, your gifts, your support. Whatever you ascribe worth to, be careful that you're not ascribing more worth or value to that thing than Jesus. You see, where is Jesus in the, on the pedestal of your life? Is he first, second, third, twelfth? The Magi intended from the very beginning to worship Jesus. That's what they came for. Verse number two, let me read it to you. It says, where, they, they said this to the king, Herod. They said, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. How did they worship? They were fully present. Their attention was completely on Jesus. And verse 11 tells us that uh, they bowed down and they opened their gifts. You see, they gave their best. They gave their very best. They gave gold. They gave frankincense. They gave myrrh. These are expensive gifts but they were also prophetic gifts. Oh man, when, I, when this was illuminated in my eyes, I was like, oh wow, I never saw it like this before. Because gold, watch this, tells us a story of what Jesus was gonna be. Each one of these gifts, gold represents, that he was the king of kings, he was royalty. The frankincense, right, was something that was burned during temple worship by the high priest showing that Jesus the Christ would be the coming high priest who was responsible for all things pertaining to sacrifice. The myrrh was used for embalming dead bodies, showing that he would be the one to offer himself up on the cross as the ultimate holy sacrifice for all humanity to pay for your sins and mine. You see, they gave the best they had. And in John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus himself says this, if you give, I'll give back to you. Man, I love that scripture. Because he said, with the same measure that you, that you measure whatever you're given to, that's the same measure I'll use to give back to you. Mm, the more you give, the more you receive is basically what he's saying. He, he, what uh, did these wise people receive in return for these gifts? Verse number 12 says, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. My goodness. Because they were willing to worship Jesus with everything that they had to give their best, God gave them his best. He gave them a dream. 
He gave them a dream that was unlike any other dream they had before because this dream, God gave them, uh, uh, they couldn't have downloaded on their mobile devices in the first century BCE. No, uh, what, what they, he gave them was internal GPS. Mm. When we are in his presence, when we are bringing him our best through worship, when we come before the King of Kings, he wants to give you the same internal navigation system. He wants to give you the Holy Spirit who guides, who informs, who speaks, who gives direction, right, to every part of our lives. Even when he seems to be silent in our lives, as we take a next step by faith, God specializes in course correction. You see, when I'm driving around the Twin Cities, I usually mute my GPS so that it's, uh, it doesn't interfere with my music. It, you know, I love to, my, my wife knows that when I get in the car, I turn the volume all the way up and it stays there, right? I, I can be jamming to my favorite playlist and not paying any attention to the screen called GPS, <laughs> and I've muted it, right? Now, because I've become dull of hearing or I've muted the voice of the navigator, I often miss all of my turns. <laughs> Have you ever been there? I, I miss turns like crazy. I am notorious for being a bad navigator. I'm not good at directions, okay? That's why I need the GPS, but here it is. I, the thing that I need is the thing that I'm muting in my own life and I'm often going down the wrong roads. Have you ever turned down a one-way street going the wrong way? I'm telling on myself, I have, and it's not a pleasant experience, especially when the person on the corner is pointing to the one-way sign and, and you're looking crazy, right? Anyway, get off of my uh, telling on myself. Uh, uh, Lindsay's over here trying not to laugh, uh, I, I think. But listen, if I give my attention back to the navigator, and turn up his volume in my life, I'll be able to hear when he's saying rerouting. I'll be able to see on the screen of my life when he is redirecting my life. You see, get back on, I can be able to get back on the right path in my life and make up for all the wrong turns that I've made in my life. You see, you can continue to keep going the wrong way or making the wrong turns if you want to and, and keep muting the voice of the navigator in your life. But what he wants you to do is to turn his voice up so that he can guide you and direct you on the right path so that you can be where he's called you to be. So how can you turn up that volume of this navigator in your life this holiday season? Listen, I want to say this. Hearing God's guidance and his voice does not always come from being silent. I know a lot of people say, you just got to have silent time, quiet time. Uh, that doesn't work for all of us. What, how to hear his voice is being present with him. Present in the moment to see what's going on around you. Present in the moment to hear and see what he's doing in, or in and around you and in your life, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your city. Right? Have the presence of mind to move out of your comfort zone and not ignore the signs when the Lord is up to something great and he's inviting you to, in, to engage to, in uh, whatever that is fully. He wants you to participate. And he, he wants us to fully be present in worship, giving the king your best this holiday season and watch what he'll do. He will direct your path and he will make things happen in your life that you couldn't make happen on your own. Being in his presence is powerful and it's life transforming. Will you commit this week to a next step? I'm gonna ask you this, will you uh, read this Christmas story that's found in Matthew? I, I want you to read chapters one and two. And will you, uh, uh, as you read that, will you consider how you can give your best to Jesus this Christmas season. Being present with my dad was a memory that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. But you know what? As we heard from Chelly at the beginning of the message, 
from children of incarcerated caregivers. There are kids right now, right here in the Twin Cities, who can't have an experience like that, who will never be able to have those type of warm memories. This Christmas, we're partnering with children of incarcerated caregivers because we want to show the love of Jesus to those children. When we contacted this organization, they said to us that no church had ever reached out to them before. Can you imagine that? So we are excited to represent Jesus the Christ to these people who need us this holiday season. They were presently, pleasantly surprised when we gave them a call, when we let them know that we were ready to, to serve them. So we want to show them this Christmas how much Jesus loves them. Will you consider making a donation today? Above and beyond your tithe, right? Above and beyond your tithe, will you reach deep and find it in your heart to make a sacrificial gift to support these children? If you are, you can click on this button right here that just popped up on your screen or go to our website or go to our app and click on give. Uh, on that page that says give, there's a drop down menu and there's one of the options that says children of incarcerated caregivers. Those funds will be used to bless families that have a parent who is incarcerated this holiday season. We love all people and Jesus calls us to remember the incarcerated and the least of these. And we certainly want to care for the children of those people. So may God bless you and may your family be blessed this holiday season as you show Jesus your love through your worship and your giving this week. Now, this is First Sunday. So every first Sunday, what we do is we participate in what we call a communion meal. And I'd love for you to grab a piece of bread or something to eat and something to drink as we take part in this remembering of what Jesus did for us. You see, communion is just that. It is an opportunity for us to uh, pause and to think about, man, what did Jesus do for me? You see, he died on the cross for you and me. But before he gave, willingly gave his life as a sacrifice on Calvary's cross for the remission of your sins and mine, he had a last meal with some of his closest friends. We called them the disciples. And at that table, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that at the table he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you have something to eat, whether it's bread or anything, will you take this bread and eat it and remember that Jesus gave his body in place of yours and mine. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Would you take this, whatever you have to drink, whether it's water or juice, and just remember for a moment that Jesus Christ shed his blood on Calvary's cross. The only way that sins can be forgiven, the scripture tells us, is by bloodshed. And he shed his blood in place of yours and mine to wash our sins away. Will you drink in remembrance? Amen. After the meal, after supper, he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so that's what we do today. Let us pray and prepare ourselves for worship. Father, we thank you for the word you gave us today, for this opportunity to support and, and give as an act of worship to you, as we give to, to help children of incarcerated caregivers. Would you Meet us in that and bless our lives as we, see, as we need, as you see fit. And God, as we have taken this communion, remind us throughout this week 
with the love that you have for each and every one of us. As we sing songs of worship now, meet us in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you. And may you have a wonderful, wonderful week.